I, I should begin by saying I never intended to be a dancer. I, I always danced, I loved dancing. I always took classes. I took classes from skilled teachers who had been performers. Did not major in dance in college because dance was in the phys ed program at Kent State University. But I got involved in the theater department in musical theater. I did get a, a job with Hullabaloo at the end of my freshman year at Kent State, I happened to be in New York taking classes, and um, they were looking for someone to go on tour with the um, Motown Review. And uh, I was pulled out of the class and invited to go on the tour, and it was a summer, a summer state fair tour. It went on to Las Vegas, but I elected to go back to Kent State to finish my college degree. And I started as a, as a psychology major, and I finished as a sociology major. Um, I think I thought I was going to be a psychological social worker, but that never happened. I was assistant to the fashion director of Glamour magazine. And during that time, like I said, I kept taking classes and I started going to auditions. I went to an audition for Hello Dolly. You know, I was the right type in the right place at the right time. And I was hired in a supporting role in a, a musical that went on tour for nine months and we did um, six weeks in, on Broadway. And then after that, I began auditioning more, and you know, I met people, performers, and they said, well, you need to take voice lessons, you need to do this, you need to audition for commercials, and I did. And I performed in, uh, I think it was three musicals that were cast in New York. There were summer, there were summer stock tours, Finian's Rainbow, Showboat. The last thing I did before I left New York was The Wiz. A film with Michael Jackson and the thing about that you know being in the right place at the right time was a costume fitting I didn't realize that and the director Sidney Lamette saw me he grabbed me by my wrist and he said come with me uh, and he, he marched me across the studio and he said to the costume person I want the paper dolls to look like her and so <laughs> then they had me lie down on this big brown sheet of paper uh, and they traced my outline. At that time, I was wearing my hair in two, two pigtails, two poofs on the side. And uh, they made the paper dolls look like me. I was the prototype for the paper dolls in, in The Wiz. And that was the last thing I did before I left New York. I went to Virginia thinking, not knowing where I would dance, you know. Uh, but it, it just, it felt like the time to leave the city, to be honest with you. Unlike many people who come to Lynchburg, Virginia, instead of coming here and downing it, she immediately sought out all the art around here. I met Helen McGee in Lynchburg, Virginia. Helen invited me to um, uh, do a residency. I taught, I think it was two weeks of classes. And then I got to take class every day at Randolph-Macon Woman's College with Helen and or the visiting artists who were there. Um, and that's when I decided to start the company, Dance by Two, two dancers and a narrator. I did it not because I wanted to perform, but because I wanted to give folks an opportunity to see live dance. And Dance by Two danced everywhere, colleges, schools. They really went into schools a lot, churches, social organizations. I also had a, a TV show that I moderated at um, uh, on WSET TV. And I always joke about this because I say, if I had been any good at that show, I would be Oprah. I came 
to uh, UNC Charlotte in 1986 after two years full-time in the graduate program at The Ohio State University. And I was really excited when I came uh, for my campus interview because it was really evident that there was a lot of creative energy spinning around. I had given up my performing career when I came here, um, but there was this thing called the faculty dance concert. So, you know, I pulled some solos out of the hat that I didn't choreograph. I've never choreographed a solo for myself, really. I performed a duet with uh, Delia Neal that was restaged by Pamela Sofros. It was a Ruby Chang piece called Box to the Entertainer, set to a Scott Joplin piece that was performed uh, on stage. And I also performed Inner Dialogue, which was a solo part of the Lec Dem that uh, Betty and I did. It was set to House of the Rising Sun. Karen Hubbard was one of the first instructors that I had. And I remember in my second year, when I declared my major, she was one of my biggest supporters. She was always so lively and energetic and knowledgeable about what she was teaching. And it was just a really fun experience for me to work with her. Today's residue is about a dream sequence. At the end of the piece, the dreamer wakes up and says, I'll never eat linguine again. <laughs> I love collaboration and uh, Karen is perfect for that. She asked me to do a soundscape for a piece this day's residue. I did a voiceover to introduce the piece with the voice like this and uh, did the music. It had special effects. It had all kinds of things in it. And I remember when she first heard it, when I sent it to her, she marveled over how it was done, but she doesn't realize I marvel over anything she does. In more recent years, I set a piece called It Is What It Is. I-I-W-I-I, -I -I. It Is What It Is, it's a jazz piece. And the title came from when I used to talk to my mentor, Pepsi Bethel, about jazz dance, he finally ended up saying, well, you know, it is what it is. I was interested in vernacular jazz, not as a performer, but as an historical reference. And I began as my project at Ohio State to develop a class. based on vernacular jazz from the first half of the 20th century. Center of gravity is lowered, torso is inclined forward, the limbs and the spine are articulated, improvisation is valued within the context of the style. The weight shifts are uh, syncopated, um, and I teach them vocabulary from the first half of the 20th century, like picking cherries, eating cherries, eating cherries, boogie. Spank the baby. Shim sham, fishtail, scoot, treads, scarecrow. They learn that vocabulary and they learn how to improvise in the context of the vocabulary. And also we talk about 
you know, historical references, how if not for enslaved Africans in the United States, we wouldn't have jazz music, we wouldn't have jazz dance. I began to change the conversation regarding jazz dance because I was at a con an NDEO conference and th there were no black jazz artists mentioned. And I just said, wait a minute, what's going on here? I was very impressed with her knowledge of jazz dance because I considered that my field. And I realized how differently she understood it than the way I did. Um, and her way was through this authentic jazz dance lens that comes out of a long African-American tradition and because of her, both her scholarship and her studies, especially with Pepsi Bethel, um, she acquired this deep, not only scholarly knowledge, but embodied knowledge. Among her publications, her scholarly publications, she has a chapter in this book on Pepsi Bethel and a chapter in this book, which has just been published on the coursework that she teaches at UNC Charlotte. Karen has been one of those people for me that we could go years without talking and then something would bring us back together and it would be like we never missed it. I really appreciate her being as real as she is, as caring as she is, as knowledgeable as she is. People need to know uh, how valuable of a resource she is, how wonderful a person she is, and the people like me who she is affecting. I've just had a wonderful, what, over 30 years here, and I feel like, you know, I, I have a dance family here. I have a department family, a, performing arts family, a university family. To me, it's all about the students. It's been about the students. The students are like my children, you know?